It's not just a cliché. I have traveled to many places around the globe, and in every corner I visit, Jews are always pointed out as the most fortunate segment of the people living there. Over the last two millennia, Jews have been expelled or segregated from almost every nation in the world, but countless times they have managed to rise again, start from scratch, and build considerable wealth in new territories. Even when expelled again, they recreate the process and return to prosperity. My people have always had more understanding of how to handle money than other people in the world. The wisdom of these eternal pieces of advice that I'm going to reveal to you has been passed down from generation to generation, allowing countless people to build financial wealth and personal growth. If you follow these simple pieces of advice, you will take the reins of your own finances and possibly accumulate a great fortune, maybe even millions and millions of dollars. These pieces of advice are not just about money, but also about your own discipline and demonstrate the love between you and your family. As we bring these precious tips from the Jewish people, you will see that they can apply to any belief or economic situation. This is the oldest financial method in the world and the only one that has persisted through the ages. Let's move forward. Have you heard that to be rich and prosperous, we need to visualize and repeat this affirmation until it becomes a powerful will that will attract more prosperity? So comment, I am prosperous and will generate wealth. Leave this comment and I will give it a heart showing that you will be the first millionaire in your family. Now that you have commented, let's move on. Keep the void filled without spending too much on useless things. How many times do we end up buying things we don't need or clothes we will never wear just because we feel an urgent need to buy and can't resist? When we act this way, we are actually filling a void in our lives with debt. It's a slow but certain path to self-destruction, which step by step leads us to depression and poverty. What we need to learn is to deal with these situations in a way that brings light and prosperity instead of more confusion. Let's imagine for a moment that there are two beings living inside us. The first is the beast, the part of our soul that controls our desires, our greed, our appetite for material goods, and our need for instant gratification. It resides deep in our belly and wants to get fatter, the more we feed it, the harder our lives become. Its goal is to cause disorder. However, this beast was created to serve as a counterbalance to our second inner being, the angel. The angel knows what is right and wrong, but sometimes the beast overpowers it. The real problem is that we are nourishing the beast, allowing it to run free and defeat the angel, and this reflects in our finances. That's why our salary comes in and goes out so quickly, making prosperity impossible. So let's do something different. Instead of feeding the beast at the expense of our future, let's try to control it and use it to our advantage, not against us. The first thing you should do is look within yourself and understand that you are equally responsible for both your successes and your failures. The next time you think about buying something expensive, Leave the store and reflect on the purchase for a week. Ignore the beast, which makes immediate satisfaction seem so attractive. I believe that the true definition of wealth is valuing what you already have, rather than yearning for what you do not have. The true definition of wealth, see your wealth from a divine perspective. Over the years, different groups have considered themselves victims. Some were from wars and atrocities, but Jews, who have been victims repeatedly throughout history, see themselves as survivors. The difference between survivors and victims is that survivors continue their lives after the tragedy, while victims remain lamenting their misfortunes. We understand that everything in the Bible has a purpose, to teach us something. We see that God took time to work and keep the seventh day as a day of rest. The concept of budgeting was created by God to offer us a prosperous life in the world He created for us. Therefore, we must learn to budget to imitate God in our financial life. Grasping these eternal truths not only prepares your family for a better future and changes the history of your family forever, 
but also gives you the necessary self-confidence. You will start to wake up every day eager to be alive and know that today is better than yesterday and tomorrow will be even better. You will be connected to the current of prosperity. Until now, your money has dictated your actions and work. Now you should turn that key, learning to tell your money how to work for you. The financial game is a team sport, your spouse, your life. Managing finances is a team job. God established a covenant with Noah after the flood and also with Abraham. A covenant is a contract between two parties. To prosper financially, you need to establish what I call a covenant with your family. This covenant will show your commitment to them and the future you want together, and they must commit too. Start by being honest about your current financial situation and where you want to go. Talk about the things that both of you will be willing to sacrifice for a more prosperous future. To advance financially, everyone must be aligned and in sync, as you and your family are literally in the same financial boat, just as Noah and his family were in the ark. As a rabbi, I spend many hours counseling married people, and in each case, I like to talk to the couple not only about compatibility and love, but also about the relationship with money. If you and your partner are not on the same financial wavelength, there is a high chance that your marriage will not work. Marriage cannot be a solo effort. Financial problems are the main cause of divorces. Money is energy. It supplies our basic needs and gives us choices and opportunities. When we save and accumulate wealth, we can choose whether we want to work or when we want to work. We can choose to help a local charity or contribute to humanitarian work in other parts of the world. We can also provide the next generations with more opportunities. According to Jewish tradition, an act of charity can change a negative decree from the heavens. Charity not only improves the world around us, but also enhances us as individuals. This is the secret of how the Jewish people built a defense against chaos in partnership with God. Sharing creates space in our lives for more blessings to arrive. Giving established an endless cycle. You earn, you give, and then you earn more. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to be successful in life? You can learn to be successful just as you learn math, chemistry, or biology. In the same way you learn these things, you can also learn to be successful which is totally different from succeeding. Being successful is one thing, succeeding is another. For example, there might be a soccer player who has a lot of success playing soccer, but if you look at his personal life, it's all in a mess. This person is successful in playing soccer, but not successful in life. To be successful in life, you have to work in various areas, in the personal, professional, financial, family, social, and friendship areas. This is the big difference between success and being successful. What are you looking for? Do you want success in something specific or do you want to be successful overall? Leave your comment. I already want to mention that if you want to be successful, watch this video until the end, because at the end of this video, you will find very valuable tips. Let's go back to our analysis. Now you might be thinking, to be successful, I would have to be born with a silver spoon. No, 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 on the contrary. Successful people in life in general had difficult childhoods. 85% of people who consider themselves successful in Brazil came from humble families. That is, they worked as employees for someone, went through difficult times. So you are not doomed to be who you always were. Your past is gone and you can't change that. But your future is not yet written. You can start writing it today. If you can understand this, it will make a huge difference in your life, simply because you understand this perspective of tomorrow. Know that we are the only animals on planet Earth with the ability to transcend. That means starting over. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter the upbringing you had in childhood. It doesn't matter what you did or didn't do until today. Tomorrow you can open a new book, start the first page. That's called transcending. But to do that, we have to make some changes first. You, me, everybody knows what I'm talking about. A series of beliefs. And our modus operandi is based on our beliefs. 
and these beliefs are often unfavorable. They are not bringing us the desirable results. A belief becomes obsolete when it is not giving us what we want, which is to evolve. So let's eliminate the obsolete beliefs that are not bringing us the desirable results. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. The secret here is to make it spin faster. Because someone has come before, studied all of this, researched millionaires, successful people, not only in terms of money, but in terms of family, health, etc. And they managed to identify what common habits these so-called successful people have. So, do you want to move towards success? I want to know where you are coming from. If you don't have a clear idea of where you are coming from, it is practically impossible to achieve the success you are seeking. So the first thing we need to know is your level of self-esteem. So I'm going to do a questionnaire here. Very yes, very no. We will take five areas of your life. Health, family, finances, professional life and friendships. And for each of these specifically, you will give a rating from 1 to 10. Then we will add up these ratings and then you will see what happens. Let's start first with health. We know people who are 30 and never get sick, right? And also, you must know people who are sick every day, so you will have to evaluate your health. If you are the type of person who never gets sick, is always well, you will give a rating of 10 because you are completely healthy. If you are a person who is sick every day, you will give a rating of 1. So, you have between 1 and 10, you will have to choose the rating that you think you deserve from 1 to 10. And then, how much would you give for your health? If you are a person who has a vice and smokes, drinks, and uses illicit drugs, of course, that will lower the rating. You have to ask your subconscious and determine what rating you have for your health. Now let's go to your family. When I say family, it's the family nucleus, my parents, children, siblings, in-laws, your family as a whole. From 1 to 10, what rating would you give? Do you have an ideal, perfect family with nothing to change? Then it's 10. Look, you first gave the rating for your health. Now you give the rating for your family. Now let's go to your financial life. How is your bank account? If you lost your job today, if you stopped working today, if something unexpected happened to you right now, how long will your current lifestyle last? This has a name. It's called an emergency fund. It's the number of days you can maintain your standard of living if you interrupt your income. If you stop working today, have you earned enough for money to work for you? Because money is an excellent employee, but a terrible boss. If you work for money, my condolences. But if, on the other hand, you put money to work for you, all right, that's what money knows how to do well, work for you. So how is your financial life? Are you the kind of person who can stop working for a while? Let's say you decide to stop working today, and what you have in savings or investments, will it yield enough to maintain your standard of living? What rating do you deserve? If you are in debt, spending more than you earn, or if you earn and spend everything immediately, you are earning and spending, earning and spending, you will give a rating close to one. It's not me, it's you who will choose this rating, just like you chose the rating for your health, for your family, now you are choosing for your financial life. But now let's go to your work, your professional life. Let me ask you a very simple question. If you won a million dollars in the lottery tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, would you continue doing the same professionally that you do now? Or would you change? If you win a million dollars tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, you are doing exactly the same. It means you are in total harmony with your professional activity. So there you deserve a 10. Now, if you are counting the days until retirement, it means you are not satisfied with what you are doing, then you deserve to receive a rating close to one or two. We saw our health, we have the rating for family, we gave our rating for finance, we gave our rating for work. I have one more rating, which is friendship. I'm not talking about acquaintances, I'm talking about friends you can count on. Who can you count on today? Who do you know will help you? If you died today, who would come to your funeral tomorrow? Without a doubt, that's a good question to see who's close to you. So friendship, you have two things. First, it's the number of friends, and second is the quality of those friendships. 
Sometimes it's much more important to have fewer friends, but of better quality. So what's the rating? Well, now you've already given a rating for your health, for your family, for your finances, for your professional life, and for your friendship. Please add up these five ratings. Now I'm going to use an example here to help you. Let's suppose I gave a seven rating to all these five areas of my life. I added seven five times, so the result is 35. I take this number and multiply it by two, now I have 70. This means that I am operating at a self-esteem potential of 70%. Do it there, let's see what happens. Take these five ratings, add them up, multiply by two, now you know where you're coming from. So, let's suppose if I'm coming from 70%, it means I'm using 70% of my self-esteem, 70% of the potential of my soul. If I now take this potential and increase it to 72, 73, this makes an absurd difference in the result. A small difference in performance brings a tremendous difference in the result. An example of this is a horse that comes in first. Compared to a horse that comes in second, the difference is a nose that's just a small difference. The nose of the first horse crossed the finish line a little before the nose of the second. But think about it, the first will be remembered forever and will win the prize and be greatly praised. And the second, it's just a difference of a nose. No one will remember who came in second. That's because it was a difference of a few centimeters, fractions of a second. So learn that a small difference in performance brings a tremendous difference in results. You compare a poor, unsuccessful individual and a millionaire successful individual they get up more or less at the same time they go to bed more or less at the same time so you see that there isn't much difference between one and the other but what is one doing they are small details done constantly strategically that makes all the difference then you find out that you are operating at 60 percent of your self-esteem then you ask me dr eden how do i improve then comes a crucial point. I will show you three things you have to do. The first thing is for you to develop a capacity for visualization, not of what you don't want, but of what you want. If you focus on what you don't want, instead of focusing on what you want, it's as if you were driving a car looking through the rear view mirror. You know where you're coming from, but you don't know where you're going. So Einstein said that imagination is more important than knowledge. Every time there was a dispute between knowledge and imagination, imagination always won. So you have to learn to imagine the situation you want. It has to exist first in your brain. Let me give you an example. You dream of acquiring a new house. You have to see how many rooms it will have, how it will be built, what color the outer wall will be, what color the inner wall will be, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, what furniture, what carpet you will put. You start creating this new house in your mind. The more specific, the more characteristics, the more details you put. It will also be easier to create because everything that exists in the physical universe was created twice. You want to see it, look around you, choose any object that you saw there, anyone. It can even be the object you're holding right now. Yes, your phone. Even before it was created, it went through someone's mind. So everything that exists in the physical universe first existed in someone's mind before manifesting in the physical universe. So you have to learn the process of visualization. It's very simple. It's you closing your eyes and focusing on what you want. In your health area, in your family area, in your professional areas, in the most important areas of your life, you have to learn to visualize. That's the first thing you need to do, but it doesn't stop there. Have you noticed that since I started talking inside your head, there's a dialogue an inner dialogue that is talking to you all the time. With many things you agree, but there are some things you disagree with. There's a conversation inside your head. There's a voice inside your head asking what voice is that? So stop for a moment and pay attention to it. Is it a friendly voice or not? Do you consider it a friend? Or is it someone who is criticizing you? It can be your own voice, it can be your father's voice, it can be your mother's voice, but there is an internal dialogue inside that makes a huge difference in your life. That's the internal dialogue. What kind of dialogue do you have? 
So, when a negative dialogue appears, you have to say, cancel, cancel, cancel. Let me tell you one more thing, the way you carry your body. What is your posture? Go to a mall in your city and spend some time observing people passing by. There will be people walking with their necks straight, looking at the horizon, right? And there will be people walking with their heads down, looking at the ground. If you're in a room and a king, a queen, a prince, a princess enters, even if you don't know they're a king, a queen, you'll see that the person who enters has majesty. What does it mean to have majesty? They walk with an upright posture. They learned since childhood, the butler taught them that they had to walk as if balancing a book on their head. When I stretch my body, imagining that there's a hook coming from the sky, pulling my head, my neck stretches, my shoulders relax. I connect with universal intelligence, that flow of intelligence there. And you know what happens. I improve my self-esteem. So, to improve my self-esteem, I have to know how to visualize. I have to know how to deal with internal dialogue. I have to cancel what is negative. This is a very serious problem. Have you ever stopped to think that all the time we are imagining things, whether positive or negative, if I say, think of an elephant? At this very moment, you are imagining an elephant. Now, if I tell you, don't think of a lion, even though I said not to think, you ended up thinking. Do you know why this happened? Because the word no has no linguistic representation. For example, a mother will say, son, don't disturb your little sister. The mother is talking to the child and he continues to disturb his sister because for the boy's subconscious mind, the mother is telling him to disturb his sister. The mother here is focusing on what she doesn't want. What this mother should do is focus on what she really wants, which in this case would be, instead of saying, son, stop disturbing your sister, she should try this. Son, could you leave your sister alone? So you have to express what you want, not what you don't want. And this also works in internal dialogue. Learn to control this, and this video will have been very worthwhile for you. It will give you immense long-term benefits. If you understand what I mean, Please comment, I understood. Now I'm going to teach another very important lesson. We are judged in life by three things. Your appearance, what you say, and how you say what you say. If someone asks you a question, how you respond makes all the difference. I can have two bricklayers laying bricks. I go to the first bricklayer and ask, what do you do in life? He, I am a bricklayer. I put one brick on top of the other. And then I ask the second bricklayer, what do you do in life? I am also a bricklayer, he will answer, and he will continue saying, I am building the Maracana, which is the largest football stadium in the world, and it will stay here for posterity. Look how interesting, both physically do the same thing, put one brick on top of the other, only one sees it as a job, and the other has a broader perspective. So this other one won't be a bricklayer for long. Soon he will own a construction company. Second, you are judged by your appearance. Do you want to play for Flamengo? Don't show up there in Fluminense's uniform. Do you want to join the army? Don't show up there in shorts and a tank top. So you have to be appropriately dressed for the occasion. I'm going to teach success, so I have to be well presented according to the situation, understand? So you can be watching however you want in shorts. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. But if I were giving this lecture in a church, for example, I couldn't be in shorts and flip-flops. I would be teaching about success, so I should be dressed in success uniform. Appearance is very important. You are judged by your appearance. You are judged by what you say. While you haven't said anything, no one knows if you're intelligent or not. But the moment you speak and speak nonsense, there's no way to go back. An arrow once launched does not return. When a spoken word is launched, it no longer belongs to you. It has been thrown into the world. So if you're not sure what you're going to say, it's better to stay silent. Most wise people are respected for speaking little. And it's not just what you say, it's how you say what you say. Two individuals can say the same thing, and the impact will be totally different. There's a phrase that goes like this, the singer is more important than the song. You're a fan of a great singer, right? I imagine he has a song that touches your heart. 
that same song sung by a singer you don't like wouldn't have the same impact on you. So, know what you're going to say, how you're going to say it, and at the right time, okay? Let me see another important piece of knowledge for you. I know, pay attention. Imagine you're going to bake a cake. This cake is not made with just flour, not just with butter, not just with eggs. Of course, butter is important. The egg is important. It's necessary, but it's not enough. The success cake we are learning has six ingredients. The first ingredient is self-esteem. The second is communication. And now comes goals, comes attitude, comes work, and comes ambition. When you put these six ingredients together with patience, persistence, which are the characteristics of the professional that the amateur doesn't have. The amateur wants everything yesterday, but nature doesn't work that way. Dawn only comes after the whole night has passed and so on. You plant a seed, the next day it's not a plant. It continues to be a seed starting its germination process, but it continues to be a seed. So I have to understand that I am on the right path and it takes time for that to happen. Many people end up making mistakes in this. Often a person gives up before things happen. That's why patience and persistence are essential. I wanted to talk to you now about a goal. It is necessary to learn to turn a dream into a goal, and then we will learn to turn a goal into reality, right? How do I turn a dream into a goal? I turn a dream into a goal by setting a date. Anything you want someday will never happen. So you'll have a dusty book on your shelf at home you said you would read someday, but it's been four years since you bought it. It's there because there's no someday on the calendar, do you agree? To start happening, you need to have a date. You say, one day we'll do this. There's no day on the calendar with that name, so it will never happen. Now you put a date. Oops, now it makes all the difference. You have to learn to put dates on your dreams. The moment you put a date on the dream, it ceases to be a dream and becomes a goal. And the universe begins to conspire in your favor. But then you turn the dream into a goal. But you need to turn it into reality. That's another story. You can't stop there. First, I want to tell you that the importance of the goal is not necessarily to achieve it but to set you in motion because who knows something more important will happen along the way. Do you want to see? I'll prove it to you. Think about the three most important things that have happened in your life so far since you can remember. What happened most importantly? Three events, your wedding, the birth of your child, or a promotion at your job. You pass the entrance exam, you graduate from college. There are many important things in your life but you will notice that at least two or three were not planned. You didn't wake up one day and say, today I'm going to meet someone because I'm going to fall in love, because I'm going to marry them. It wasn't like that. You just went somewhere, fell in love, planned and got married. And that job you have there, you got a job at a company. Did you wake up one day and say, today I'm going to become an employee at this company? Did it happen like that? No, you saw an advertisement, someone invited you, went for an interview, handed in your resume, got approved, and one day that you never imagined, someone called you and said, you start working tomorrow. Interesting. I have to have goals to put me in motion, but I have to have my mind prepared for better things, right? Then maybe other opportunities more important than the one you're focusing on will arise in your life. You have to have this flexibility. And this goal cannot be just one thing. There must be diversification. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Someone comes and carries your basket, it's over, takes all your eggs. For example, do you only have the profession of being a mother, which is the noblest profession on planet Earth, being a mother, and you dedicate yourself entirely to being a mother? Look at the risk you're taking. If you are a mother, one day your children will grow up, they will leave. We raise children for the world. They don't stay with us, they go take care of their lives. And then what will you say? Oh, but now I feel empty. It's the empty nest syndrome. It's the mother who dedicated her entire life to her children. The children grew up, went to take care of their lives, and the mother feels alone. So you have to have diversity, you have to have a financial goal, you have to have a professional goal, you have to have a social goal, you have to have a family goal, you have to have a health goal. What's the use of earning a lot and having a heart attack when you're 40? Is it worth it? 
I won't take anything to the grave. The coffin has no drawer. The coffin has no pocket. Why earn all this money and leave this life without enjoying it? So you have to have leisure goals. I have to diversify my goals. This is very important. You set a goal and it has to be remembered. Don't remember it only on December 31st and think it's all sorted out. No, no, no. You have to remember it every day. The Orientals take a doll called Daruma. I don't know if you know, and paint one eye of the doll, paint the right eye of the doll, and then there's still the left eye to paint, and they put that doll on the table. That doll represents a goal, buying a new house. So every time they look at that doll, they remember the goal. It serves as a reminder for it. There are several Darumas in the room, many with both eyes painted and some with only one eye painted, because the goal has to be remembered. For example, are you studying medicine just because it's your parents' dream? No, 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 it's all wrong. Tell your father to take the entrance exam. You have to pursue a goal that is yours, that you really desire, understand? If an Oriental said he would buy a new house, and when he buys it, he goes there and paints the other eye of the doll. If you enter an Oriental's house, you will see that there are several Darumas in the room, many with both eyes painted and some with one eye painted. In 1945, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, everything was destroyed. 40% of Japan destroyed. Today, it is among the top five countries in the world. Do you know what happened? Can you guess? From 40% destroyed to among the top five countries in the world. Remember this philosophy called Kaizen, always improve, continuous improvement. When you say, I don't want anything else in life, I say, then it's time for you to die because you're here to learn. Or rather, when you die, when you transcend, when you change your cosmic address, and when you get there on the other side, they will ask you three questions. The first question is, what did you learn there? This is a school, we are learning. The second question is, how is your passage through planet Earth? Did you make a better place for those who will come after you? And lastly, and most importantly, they will ask you, did you cost more than you contributed or did you contribute more than you cost? Or rather, I recommend to you, when you put your head on the pillow to sleep at night, ask yourself a question. Did I cost more than I contributed or did I contribute more than I cost today? And this today keeps adding up keeps adding up, keeps adding up, right? Before that, it is important for you to consider this. I want to make it clear to you that life is a sequence of hellos and goodbyes. To give the next hello, you have to say goodbye. The big hello of your life you won't remember. But you gave it when you arrived here on planet Earth. You came here crying and everyone here to welcome you was smiling. I hope that when you die, when you transcend, when you change your cosmic address, it happens exactly the opposite, that you leave smiling because you fulfilled your mission. And whoever stays here will be crying because you are leaving. And you have to learn to work with these six ingredients, self-esteem, communication, goals, work, attitude, ambition. And as I said, what distinguishes the professional from the amateur is patience and persistence. I don't need to worry about my weaknesses. I need to focus on my strengths. These strengths will make my weaknesses disappear. That's the big catch. So if you're not prepared, it's no use. If I offer you 20,000 euros a month to teach German in Germany and you don't speak German, it's useless. So when you are prepared and the opportunity appears, because it will appear, and most of the time it comes in the form of a problem. So when it appears and you are prepared, people call it luck. Luck is nothing more than the opportunity arriving and you being prepared to seize it. In other words, your luck is built by you. That person adrift waiting for something to happen, nothing will happen at all. That's the big problem. Be prepared when the great opportunity comes. If you watch this video all the way through, comment like this. This is the secret of life. Just comment that this is the secret of life. When I see this comment, I will know that you watch this whole video and it shows that you are a persistent and patient person. You are closer to success than those who left halfway through the video. Now I imagine that you want to increase your knowledge even more, right? So on your screen, there is a video 
where I will teach you how to leave poverty and achieve wealth in six months, so click on it and watch it now.